Hey, y'all. Matt Smith back here with you. Week 8 SEC preview today. Um, this is going to be a tough one. Not, not a whole lot in, on this slate, both in the SEC and nationally. We'll do what we can to get through it, but probably a bit of a shorter video here just because there isn't a heck of a lot to talk about. Uh, we have 11 of the 14 SEC teams taking their off week, either this week or next week. So pretty light slate, five games this Saturday, four games next Saturday. Uh, before things get cranked back up in November with, I think, everyone but Vanderbilt having had their off week behind them. So a pretty furious close to the season coming but for these next couple weeks. Uh, some pretty light slates and a, and a lack of appealing games. So I'm going to start with the LSU situation. Obviously, we couldn't touch much about that on Sunday as Ed Ordron was not fired until late Sunday evening. Uh, very bizarre press conference with him and Scott Woodward, I thought. But a pretty unique situation there where he is – going to go to the rest of the season. Don't know about a bowl game at this point. They might not even make one. So going to be kind of awkward in Baton Rouge. As far as going forward, uh, we know Scott Woodward likes to swing big based on his recent hires in baseball and in women's basketball. I'm sure he's going to take some uh, take some swings again at guys like Jimbo Fisher. I don't think Dabo Swinney's a legitimate option. Uh, certainly Lane Kevin will be in play there. I think he's a really good fit at Ole Miss, so I'm not convinced he would make that jump, but it's certainly possible. Wouldn't rule anything out there. I would tend to put my money on Mel Tucker or Dave Aranda. They're probably in the Tier 2 candidate list, and that might be perceived as settling for Woodward and perhaps a lot of the LSU fan base as well. Uh, but Tuck, Tucker makes a lot of sense. Got a ton of SEC experience at Alabama, at Georgia. Spent a year, I believe, at LSU back in the early Saban tenure. Has coached now will be three head coaching years at Colorado and Michigan State. Done a really nice job. Even year one at Colorado was pretty decent. Never really got to see how that how far that program could climb under him because he left for Michigan State. After a rough first year, of course, in a COVID year, uh, has really performed well. Spartans 7-0 and off this week and getting ready for their big run of Big Ten East games coming up after their off week. So I think he's a top candidate. I think Dave Aranda at Baylor as well. Obviously, was in Baton Rouge for four years as the defensive coordinator, won a national title there in 2019 under Orgeron. He's an interesting guy. I could see him being kind of content at Baylor and even the lore of a big-time job like LSU. Uh, maybe he's in good shape. We know Baylor pays their coaches pretty well, so I don't think it's going to be that big of a financial uh, burden for him to just stay in Waco. And I think he might like being out of the spotlight. And again, he's kind of an interesting guy, unique personality, and he may just want to let it go with Baylor. They're having a good year and seeing if they can't compete in the revised Big 12 going forward. So if I had to guess right now, I'd go with Mel Tucker, but don't doubt Woodward landing a big fish. I, I just don't see it being guys like Jimbo, Dabo Swinney. Again, Lane Kiffin's in play, but my hunch is he's going to stay at Ole Miss. So I'd go with Tucker if I had to pick a guy, probably a random number two, but a lot to play out here over the next month in terms of what direction that search is headed. Um, I guess we'll spin that right into the LSU Ole Miss game. Uh, 3.30 CBS on Saturday. Lane Kiffin was kind of coy about Matt Corral's status earlier in the week that he might have some concerns about his availability coming out of the Tennessee game. Long game, had 30 carries, uh, took a lot of hits. The offense was depleted with injuries, so he had to kind of carry the load to that win in Knoxville last week. Um, by Vegas, not moving the line at all. I think they think he's going to play. It sounds like he's practicing, so I think he's going to give it a go. Again, not sure what the motivation was for Kiffin to say that. It really just, was just a smoke screen to throw at LSU. I don't know. Kind of strange coming from a guy who really doesn't talk at all about injuries um, to make that statement on Monday, but he did. Again, I expect Corral out there. For LSU, nothing to lose. Kind of a scary situation for Ole Miss. Uh, they may have found a running game, running for 280, 300 yards against uh, against Florida. Tarion Davis-Price emerging as, as a top back. Finally found a running game as that offense kind of reinvents itself without Keishon Boutte and a true number one receiver there. So in this position for Ole Miss in the past, it hasn't gone well. Um, pressure is all on the Rebels this week. LSU, again, not a whole lot to lose. Coming in to try and really upend a lot of the goals the Rebels have for the rest of the season. And it's just a matter, again, of the maturity of Matt Corral, of that Ole Miss team. Can they handle the pressure? Eli Manning's jersey retirement, probably at halftime on Saturday. So just a whole lot going on in Oxford. Can they withstand all that pressure in the freeze era? Oftentimes they could not. But again, I think this team's different. I think you've got a super mature quarterback in Corral, and I think they do enough to win. I don't know if LSU will have that same fire they had a week ago in, against Florida. Line's about nine and a half. I'm pretty close to that. I'm kind of like 38-27. 
Ole Miss. That over-under is up in the 70s again. I think with the progress we saw from the Ole Miss defense last week, I thought they played pretty well. I think I'd take the under as my as my favorite pick. If I had to go aside, I'd go Ole Miss and lay what's about nine and a half right now in Vegas. Uh, Tennessee-Alabama ESPN primetime game. Also have some quarterback injury issues there with Hendon Hooker. Looked like he had a hamstring and an ankle coming out of the Ole Miss game last week for Tennessee. So will he be able to go? Well, I have to go back to Joe Milton, who had to finish that game late Saturday night against Tennessee. That's probably the big question mark there. Also, Tyon Evans' availability. He tried to go last week against Ole Miss. Didn't work out in the pregame uh, run through. So they'll need him to get that running game going. Passing game, obviously a much different task for Alabama this week. Coming out of the what we would call the air raid, but it's more essentially the dink and dunk air raid from what Mississippi State likes to do. Um, Tennessee's going to stretch the field. they got pretty good receivers. Didn't do a whole lot last week against Ole Miss. Again, I thought the Rebels' defense played pretty well. It was probably the most underrated storyline coming out of that wild and crazy game last Saturday in Knoxville. So a different ta- a different task for the Alabama defense, but um, some concerns we had coming out of the A&M loss. I thought they answered them on both sides of the ball last week. Called out John Mechie last week saying that guy needs to make more big plays, more splash plays, and he did just that. Caught a big play early for a, a touchdown. And the Alabama route was on. So if they're getting that continued play out of Mechie, Jamison Williams is certainly emerging into a star. I think we're going to start to see Alabama clicking on both sides of the ball as they enter that stretch run here. So line's about 25. Again, that's probably somewhat due to the concern about Hooker's availability. I'm just going to lay them. I'm thinking 44, 17, 45, 17. I think Alabama figured some things out. They still have a little bit more uh, pain to inflict. Uh, coming out of their frustrations from two weeks ago against A&M. So I'd lay the points. Not a real super strong lean there. Um, but I thought Tennessee, with the emotions of last Saturday night, going through so late, having so many plays on both sides of the ball, just such a quick turnaround here, especially with a quarterback uncertainty to have to go to Tuscaloosa. And uh, one other note in that series, just how streaky it's been. It's crazy going back to the post-war era. Here are the numbers. It was 9-1-3 Tennessee over a 13-year stretch. Uh, Then Bear came in. It was 5-0-1 for Alabama. Tennessee won four straight, kind of in the late 60s, early 70s, when Bear was trying to reinvent from a passing game into the wishbone. Uh, Then he went on a run, won 11 straight in the mid-70s, late 70s. Tennessee won four straight there, right at the end of Bear. And it was 9-0-1 Alabama in the Curry-Stallings era, late 80s, early 90s. Tennessee goes 10-2 and two under Fulmer from the mid-90s to the mid-2000s. And obviously Alabama's won 14 straight. So as big as this rivalry is perceived to be, it's hardly been a, a time where it matters to both teams from a national scale. You had a couple big games. I remember 96, I think Alabama was undefeated. Tennessee had one loss to Florida. Top 10 matchup there. Uh, but for anyone kind of under 40, this game just probably doesn't resonate with you unless you're a diehard Tennessee or diehard Alabama fan just hate them. Uh, because of the history, the terms of the guy, the random guy in Iowa who wants to watch a big SEC game, he's thinking more of, you know, Tennessee, Florida, maybe when he was a kid, um, Alabama, LSU, of course, in recent years, Georgia, Florida, but this rivalry just doesn't resonate because it just hasn't mattered because both teams have not been at their best at the same time. Really weird. I just wanted to mention that um, given the, the prestige of this rivalry, but the lack of truly big games from a national perspective over the last 30, 40 years. Primetime game on SEC Network, South Carolina A&M. Zeb Nolan back out there again after leading the comeback against Vanderbilt last week. Luke Doty's going to have foot surgery. He's down for the rest of the year. Uh, South Carolina is just a gross football team right now. I don't see how they score maybe more than one garbage time touchdown against this A&M defense, which played really well last week at Missouri in a possible letdown spot. So Zach Calzada probably doesn't have to do a whole lot again this week. They relied on the running game last week against Missouri. This week I think they rely on the defense. And they should get to their off week at 6-2 and two with no problems, I think, in 38-7. to seven, Kind of an ugly game. I'm um, just gonna not, not going to be a whole lot of points for the Gamecocks by any means, whether it's Doty, um, who's out, or Nolan getting the start again. Just Kevin Harris is struggling. Offensive line is struggling. Don't see a true number one receiver emerging. So it, it's just a slog right now for the Gamecocks. Not unexpected, uh, but probably will make this game mostly unwatchable on Saturday night in College Station there. Uh, Mississippi State Vanderbilt, that's your late afternoon SEC Network game. I think Vanderbilt has some belief. Obviously, they should have won that game, let it get away at the end last week at South Carolina. This was only a one-score game last year in Starkville when they played 24-17. to We kind of know Mike Leach's history of screwing around with bad opponents. I think Vanderbilt's in a stretch here, starting with last week. They have Mississippi State at home on Saturday, of course. 
host Missouri next week before their off week. I think they're in a stretch here where, hey, if we can find an SEC win, it's going to happen here in these next couple of weeks. So I think they're going to be dialed in here for two home games. I think they got a real shot. Uh, the line's 21. I think that's way too many points given Will Rogers' injury, uh, the, the inconsistencies from this Mississippi State offense. And again, I think we'll see some belief from Vanderbilt. So I'm going to take those points. I don't think Vanderbilt wins the game, but I think it's maybe 24-14, 28-14. I think their defense has taken some strides over the past couple of weeks. Mike Wright's going to start. Maybe he can inject some life into that offense, um, which has a pretty tough task against a, a stout Bulldogs defense. But again, I think Vanderbilt will play well, given all the factors. Mississippi State coming off the Alabama game. I think Vanderbilt hangs, so I felt pretty comfortable taking those 21 points um, in the Commodores, at least make this interesting into the second half. And the early SEC Network game, Arkansas Pine Bluff at Arkansas, first in-state opponent in about 75 years for the Razorbacks. Um, Little Rock, those games have really diminished in terms of quality, so we might see that phase out. There's the politics in Arkansas with wanting them to play in Little Rock, but they're supposed to play Missouri there, and then they switch it up, move that game back to Fayetteville because they've done so much work on that stadium. Why are you not playing all your SEC games up there? It makes a ton of sense. So um, Little Rock's kind of just being left with junk for the short term. It might be out of, out of the picture completely in the long term. But uh, So in Little Rock there, Arkansas Pine Bluff will bad, bad FCS team one and five. And just to get right a couple of weeks here for the Razorbacks after a brutal stretch of their schedule uh, with A&M, with Georgia, Ole Miss, and Auburn. They'll get right this week with an easy win, get the week off next week. And some interesting games in early November against Mississippi State and LSU, where if you win those games, you can – Absolutely say the season was a, a, a smashing success. Um, but if you lose those two, maybe you have a five-game SEC losing streak, then this thing starts to slip a little bit back to where we maybe thought it would be at the beginning of the year with more of a six-and-six six type team. So a couple weeks for the Hogs to get right, get KJ Jefferson some rest after taking so many hits over the past few weeks. Um, not a whole lot to real talk about there other than the game is in Little Rock and the politics that go along whenever the Razorbacks are down in the middle part of the state. Uh, the national slate, as I mentioned, it's pretty ugly. The early window, I mean, go outside if it's a nice fall Saturday. I go pumpkin picking, spend some time with your family, check back in at 2.30 Eastern for the fourth quarter of these games. A um, couple Big Ten games, Illinois, Penn State, Northwestern, Michigan. Maybe Northwestern, just because of their history, could hang around in Ann Arbor. But I have a hard time seeing it. That's a pretty bad team this year, despite knocking off Rutgers, uh, Rutgers last week, Michigan off, a, off an off week. Uh, looks like a legit top 10 team. So I don't think anything there in the Big Ten. Oklahoma at Kansas, gross. Um, actually, the two most interesting games are probably the two service academy games. Cincinnati's a four-touchdown favorite at Navy, but it's Navy. It's the triple option. Uh, maybe they can throw something at them they're not used to seeing, of course. Um, this isn't a classically good Navy team by any stretch. They're, they're below 500. So wouldn't expect that game to be close, but you never know with a service academy. And then Wake Forest Army, probably the best game of the early slot. Wake Forest still undefeated, coming off an off week, which I think plays into their hands, going against Army in the triple. Um, Army had a, a tough game with Wisconsin last week, struggled to get going, had a couple late touchdowns to make that game interesting. I think situationally this favors Wake Forest, though they're only a three-point favorite, so we'll touch on that in best bets. But if there's one game to watch in early, it's Wake Forest and Army, as crazy as that sounds. Uh, late afternoon, that's where everything is this week. They're all stacked up in that 3, 3.30 Eastern window. Wisconsin-Purdue, huge Big Ten West game. Uh, Big Ten Network at 3 o'clock. Uh, 3.30, you got Clemson and Pitt on ESPN. Pitt still undefeated in conference play. Clemson, can they finally get something going on offense? They're a dog in the ACC for the first time since, depending on your book, uh, either the 2016 Louisville game um, or I believe the 2014 Florida State game. They were kind of flipping between a pick on a slight favorite, a slight dog, and that Louisville Lamar versus Deshaun game back in 2016. So that stat can vary depending on what, where you're pulling your number from. But regardless, it's been a while since Clemson's been a dog in an ACC game. But they will be on Saturday against Kenny Pickett as he continues this kind of hipster Heisman campaign for the Panthers. We have Oregon-UCLA, big game in the Pac-12. Uh, UCLA win, win probably knocks out the Pac-12 from any playoff contention. That would give everybody two losses. Um, but for the Ducks, they're still in it, having that win over Ohio State in their holster, but having to go on the road, play Chip Kelly. Ducks are pretty banged up, did not look good last Friday night and squeaking by Cal. UCLA went up to Washington and got a, a pretty good win up there in Seattle, so playing with some confidence now. 
after losing to Arizona State a couple weeks back. So a slight favorite for UCLA. I think I like the Bruins here. I think the Ducks are just too banged up. I'm still not a huge believer in Anthony Brown. If, if they can at least throw some oops, throw something at Kayvon Thibodeau, which Cal could not in terms of blocking him last week. I think UCLA gets through this one. Uh, big game in the Big 12, Oklahoma State at Iowa State. Cyclones a seven-point favorite. I think they're kind of being undervalued in the polls, probably not in Vegas because they are minus seven against an undefeated top 10 Oklahoma State team. But when you look back, they had a, a loss at, Iowa, at home to Iowa, uh, dominated that game from a staff perspective, just the turnovers killed them there. Lost a really close game at Baylor, who's turned out to be pretty good. And we kind of wrote off the Cyclones. So I think um, they're going to come back. They're going to have their name in this Big 12 title race here. And I think Vegas believes in them too, obviously making them a seven-point favorite. So I'd like Iowa State to win the game. A full touchdown's a lot against a pretty good defense that the Cowboys will take up there to Ames. Uh, but a fun matchup. And if Oklahoma State wins this game, I think we're almost at that point locked into two bedlams in back-to-back weeks. Next given weekend in Stillwater, and then probably for the Big 12 title a week later down in Arlington. Uh, let's see what else we got. Uh, BYU-Washington State is also in that late afternoon window. Um, obviously, the crazy story with Nick Rolovich getting fired on Monday. How will uh, the Cougars, the Washington State Cougars, at least respond to having an interim coach being down so many assistants? Uh, I think they do support Rolovich, but that doesn't mean they can't turn the page and regroup and not just write the season off because they've been playing some pretty good football, beat Oregon State beat Stanford the last two weeks, but just how the Cougars respond from one of the most strangest weeks you'll see within a program, uh, having a coach getting fired because of a, a state vaccine mandate, um, just crazy. So BYU obviously slumping with two losses in a row, trying to uh, right the ship up in Pullman on Saturday. Uh, let's see, LSU and LSU will Miss, of course, that's also at 3.30. So again, everything is kind of condensed in that late afternoon window. We talked about the early afternoon window being gross and the primetime window. You have Tennessee, Alabama. It's Tennessee, Alabama. We don't expect to compete a game there. Ohio State, Indiana. I doubt they put the uh, entertainment value on the screen that they did a, a year ago in Columbus. Hoosiers are struggling right now without Michael Penix. I think the Buckeyes should roll there in Bloomington. Uh, Mountain West, San Diego State, un still undefeated. They're going on the road to Air Force. So a potential slip up there uh, for the Aztecs. We've seen right for the pick and barely got out of San Jose last week in double overtime. Back on the road this week. Kind of seems like this might be the week the Aztecs take their first loss up in Colorado Springs. Uh, USC and Notre Dame are going to play a football game. Again, kind of like Tennessee, Alabama, it just seems like not a lot of those games have mattered where both teams are good at the same time. Uh, USC obviously dominated the 2000s when Notre Dame was down. Notre Dame's been really good for the last seven or eight years. That's when USC has kind of fallen off the map. So what USC team is going to show up? They've been better on the road this year, been blown out in three Pac-12 home games, both teams off last week. Who knows what to expect? Notre Dame's the better team, I think, but what are they going to do at quarterback? Will they be playing musical chairs again? So a whole lot of uh, uncertainty, I think, for both teams coming out of the bye, but it's just hard to trust USC at all right now. And the weather looks pretty chilly, so possibly another advantage for Notre Dame, about a seven-point favorite there in South Bend. NC State, Miami, kind of an interesting game in the ACC. Do we believe in the Wolfpack now? Real nice win last week up at Boston College. Have the Clemson win. If they do go to Coral Gables and win, I think that sets up probably NC State, Wake Forest in November. Uh, and Winston-Salem is probably a de facto ACC Atlantic game, particularly if Clemson does take their second conference loss uh, on Saturday in Pittsburgh. Utah, Oregon State, good Pac-12 game. Uh, Utes are still undefeated in Pac-12 play, believe it or not. Took those two early losses in the non-conference, kind of wrote them off as a, a strange lost underachieving year for Kyle Whittingham's programs. Uh, we spoke too soon. They rallied undefeated last year or right now. Huge comeback win last week against Arizona State. And a tricky game now up, at, up in the Corvallis against a fresh rested Oregon State team who was off last week. And uh, no late night games. There's no TV games after 7.30 Eastern. You'll see you can find New Mexico State and Hawaii late night on a, on a stream if you want to. Uh, but no TV games. Again, just a weird week from a schedule perspective. A, being so light. And B, having everything condensed in the late afternoon window. So not a great viewing experience on Saturday. Make sure you're tuned in for the late afternoon games. But again, outdoor activities, even a dinner. I'll sign off on those this week. I don't usually do that in the fall. But uh it's pretty meager this week, so again, focus on your late afternoon window in terms of where all the action should be on Saturday. A couple best bets. I think we've touched on most of these games, at least briefly. 
couple Big Ten games. I like Purdue getting three points at home against Wisconsin. I think they're a pretty good team. Anytime I can get points with Wisconsin um, and at home, I'm good. I just don't think the Badgers offense can score probably more than 20 points. Love what Purdue did last week at Iowa. David Bell's a stud. Um, so I'll take the Boilers getting three points against the Badgers in a, probably a Big Ten West elimination game there. Penn State, 23 and a half at home against Illinois. I don't know if Sean Clifford's going to play. I thought he was. Now I'm thinking he, they might not and hold him out another week with the Buckeyes on the docket next week. But still, Illinois is a bad football team. Brett Bielema called out some of the talent on his roster earlier this week. I don't know why he did that. That makes no sense. Um, really bad look for him. So 23 and a half, a decent number um, from a Vegas perspective, under just under a key number of 24. I'll lay lows and I'll take Penn State coming off the off week to uh, – Again, take out some frustrations from that loss at Iowa a couple weeks back. Uh, again, we just touched on the Pac-12. Oregon State is plus three at home against Utah. Again, kind of like Purdue, I kind of like that spot. Oregon State rested. Again, Utah come down off the high. I have a very emotional win last week against Arizona State. Up at Corvallis, potentially some weather there. I'll take the Beavers getting a full field goal at home. Friday night, again, we didn't touch on Arizona and Washington. I hate betting on Arizona at all because they're so bad. 18-game losing streak, but they are getting 18 points and playing at home against Washington, who has a kind of like Wisconsin. If I can get that many points, especially at home against Washington, I'm going to take them. So I might look like an idiot when this is 35-3 to Washington, um, but I'm going to take the 18 in Arizona. doubt they get that first win in more than two years, but I think they can keep this thing close. And Wake Forest, minus three at Army again, situationally. I get the Army factor. They played Michigan, Oklahoma, Wisconsin, all tough the past couple years in these spots. But I think Wake Forest having the off week, I, I think they can score enough, or even if they are having some issues uh, defensively and with time of possession, I think they'll do enough to win to stay undefeated. So Wake Forest, minus three on the road up in West Point. And I think that wraps it up. So we'll see what happens. Again, not optimistic about a lot of curveballs this week. We probably will get some fun games, just not of those well anything more impactful than bull positioning how about let's enjoy it again we don't have that many of these saturdays left so i'll enjoy it but again the focus should be on that late afternoon window where all the uh, the action should be from at least a national conference title playoff perspective i would say so thanks so much for watching guys uh, please like and subscribe to the channel reach out to me on twitter of course at matt smith cfb written preview will be up late wednesday night or early thursday morning on southernpigskin.com Appreciate all the feedback, guys. I will talk to you for the Week 8 recap on Sunday. See y'all.